This is a video to show you how to get started with um, the Traverse your program and um, at the end of this video I will also provide a C program so that you can use that to um, get a get further understanding of uh, the Traverse program. So let's go ahead. So I'm switching back to the uh, quiz. So I'm copying and pasting a few things, you know, just so that I can get the program going. So I'm going to copy this to Traverse.c because I'm constructing a C program. And this is what I'm pasting. And then we also have the function itself, which is described here. I'm not sure whether you can see it. I don't think you can see it, but because I'm recording a specific window. Oop, nope, nope. I think you can see that one. There we go. All right, so these are the two main pieces that I need, but I also need a little bit more, uh, which I, I can use you know, the um, assembly code for. So let me go ahead and you know, start editing um, both the C version, which is traverse.c, and then the other one is traverse-4.ttpasm, which is provided to you already. So now we can see the two you know, side by side and I'm going to have to include standard integer.h first so that I can reference you know, the types of like uin8 underscore t. <coughs> so here, this is the part where we have the entry code of the, um, I'm just double checking, make sure, making sure things are being recorded. So um, this part here is the entry code, it calls main as if it is just a normal function. So that's basically what we have been doing in the class already. And then this part here, which is struct node, is equivalent to these label definitions. They match exactly so that we have, actually, I take it back, <laughs> we, it's not exactly. Um, so basically these are off a little bit. So this is the thing about uh, using label definitions is as long as the label definitions are consistent and we are not actually calling uh, the functions you know, from C or assembly code, they actually should be, it, will, it should work just fine. Okay, it, they should work. So what I'm going to do here is to make the C code consistent with the assembly code. And you can see how L is the first member of the structure of node here. So I'm just you know, exchanging the order between L and value. Now you don't have to do that. Um, um, if you are just you're know, testing the C code, but to be consistent, you know, this is what I would you know, like to do. But it won't impact any uh, of the other code because um, as long as it is consistent, where we find L and value and R, we should be fine. All right, so that's the uh, struct definition in C. This is sort of you know, parallel to the struct definition, but in uh, TTP ASM. Uh, traverse is your own code, so I am not providing the code. This is the return of Traverse, uh, which corresponds to this particular close brace over here. So whatever is in between is up to you to implement. Um, this is not a whole lot of code, but it is um, a little bit of a complex piece of code in order to get it done. So what I'll do next is I am going to finish up the rest of the program. So you have the equivalence of the assembly code that is already provided to you in C. So here, N1, N2, N3, N4, and N5, they're all global variables because you can see how the labels correspond directly to the byte uh, directive here, which means you know, these are all you know, located statically in memory and they are not on the stack. They are not relative to the stack pointer. So I would do the same thing here. So we have struct node N1 and it has three members. Um, then we have a um, percent N2 and then followed by a 5 followed by an M percent of N3 because each label definition here, N1 all the way up to N5, is a label of the address of the corresponding structures. Now, this is not going to compile because your know, N2 is a forward reference in C, and in order for a forward reference in C to work, you have to say uh, something, uh, I, think it's, I think you need an X term first. So you basically have to say, yes, I am going to define um, N2 and N3 as well as N4 
and M5 you know, later. Um, but you know, we'll get to those later. That's what extern is can be used for is to simply to allow you to have a forward reference. Um, and then we will define the next one, which is struct node N2. And in this case, N2 has a null pointer and then followed by a value of three, followed by the address of N4. And then we have struct N node N3. And this one has N5, the address of N5, and then the value of 10, and then followed by a null pointer. And then we have node N4, which has no a null pointer, followed by uh, four, followed by no again. There we go. And then we have node N5, which is like zero, nine, and then followed by a zero like so. All right, so now we have all uh, the five structures already defined. It is time to define main. So this is also uh, an interesting exercise in a way because you know, I am actually uh, translating the code in a reverse way. I have the assembly code and now I'm translating it back to C code. So um, it can be an interesting exercise you know, for uh, you to kind of understand you know, because you know, uh, we in class, we only talk about how to translate from C code into assembly code. But now I'm actually reading the assembly code and translating, translating it back to C code. So there are um, interesting ways you know, that we can do this you know, because I can see that I have a local var size here that's based on main array pointer one plus. So array pointer is a pointer, and this one is referring to, to the size of a pointer in uh, TTP. So that kind of makes sense. But this is array pointer. Uh, so when we look at the definition of array pointer, it is a main array buffer size plus. So that means you know, this is a buffer size, and that means your main array has five bytes in it. And you know now this is the type information is not here, um, but main array basically is an array of five bytes, so that's what we're gonna do here. So we say u int eight underscore t. Um, we have array, and it has you know buff size number of items in it. And the way we define buff size, there are several ways to do this. Um, I typically use you know, uh, a pound defined buff size five. This is one way to do it. The other way is to use a const um, a constant to do it, but it doesn't have to be like that. You know, there are quite a few ways to do it. So array pointer is one byte, but it doesn't say what kind of a pointer it is. So uh, it is actually just a pointer to a unsigned AB integer. So in this case, array pointer is just that. All right, so moving along. Now, when we read the rest of the code, um, it actually can be implied how uh, the, what the types are supposed to be for the local variables. There are two of those. So now we look at this code here. Um, local var size is put into register A, and then we decrement that much from D. That's allocating for the local variables, and it should be matched by you know a add at the end here. So, um, yep, okay, so that's fine because you know, we, are, we have the matching code here. And then, so that has no uh, C code equivalence because uh, the C code does it automatically. The compiler generates this code uh, without us having to worry about it. So the actual code to translate starts here. Um, so we put main array into register B and then we add D to B. So that means we're getting the address of array. And then on the other side, we have array pointer put into register A. Oh, this is register B, sorry. So we have register B um, having ultimately having the address of the array with the name array. And then register A ends up with the address of the local variable array pointer. And then we store B, which is the address of array, into array pointer. So on the other side here, now we know what that statement is supposed to be. Array pointer is simply initialized to the address of array. So given this, um, 
we can sort of tell what the type is supposed to be, um, sort of. Okay, I say sort of because um, technically speaking, we are taking the address of um, the first byte of the array into you know, and storing that into array pointer. So technically, that is what we are doing. Um, so you know, the the type of array pointer is not directly implied by all of this stuff here. But it, it, you will see later on, you know, how I can actually determine the type of array pointer, because you know, the, by the time we call the function traverse, um, how the function, the prototype of the function traverse, would actually help us understand this part too. All right. So more translation. Um, okay. In fact, what I will do is I'm going to say that you know, from all we can tell in the assembly code, this is all we can tell, and then we'll go back and fix it later. All right, so getting back to the assembly code, what is the next thing we're going to do? So this is getting the offset to array pointer. We get to the address of array pointer, and then we push it on the stack. So in this particular context, you know, there's no particular reason to push this on the stack. So it probably is you know, setting up for function call. So in the C code, I am going to say mm, this is probably some kind of function call, and then the last parameter is the address of array pointer because that's what we're pushing on the stack. So now we look at you know, what else are we pushing on the stack. So this is pretty simple. Um, we are just taking the label n1, which is representing the address of the global variable n1. We put it into register A, and then we push that on the stack. So that means, hmm, OK, so we are probably pushing the address of n1 on the stack, and we are pushing the arguments in reverse order. So that's why the, uh, the address of array pointer is the last argument, and then the address of m1 is the second to the last parameter. And after that, we just you know, do a call, a regular call, because we are pushing the return address uh, with these three instructions, and then we continue execution at traverse. So that means you know, this function that we are calling is simply traverse. All right. So at this point, um, there's something kind of important. There's nothing else that we're doing. Uh, these two increment these are for cleaning up the arguments you know, of traverse, because we'll still have those two arguments sitting on the stack. So it's for cleaning up that. And then this is the return code already. So that means, technically speaking, um, we are done with uh, main here. OK, give it all semicolons. OK. So this is where you know I can figure out exactly what the type of array pointer is supposed to be, because we know that we are passing the address of array pointer to the function traverse. So we look at the prototype of traverse, and we can see that the second parameter uh, is called array. I know it's a little bit confusing, but this is parameter array and not the local variable array of main. And we can see this is a double pointer to a u in a underscore t. So that means the address of array pointer has to match you know, these two things. So we are looking at the address of the address of an u in a underscore t. But that is the type of the address of array pointer, which means array pointer should be the address of a u in a u in a underscore t. So that's why you know, this is the correct type to initialize. So based on that, uh, when we try to initialize array pointer itself using the address of array, that means you know, we have to use the address of a particular element of array, which is a u in eight underscore t, because that would match you know, all the type and definitions. It will make everything you know, consistent. So that's kind of you know, how um, we can uh, reference the C code, um, or at least a portion of the given C code, to kind of reverse engineer you know, exactly what the types of each local variable is supposed to be. All right, so um, this is the code. Um, and you know, basically, if I need to explain what the code is going to do, um, it is going to quote unquote traverse um, the, basically the data structure that starts off with, you know, in this case, N1. And n1 has a left. Okay, so let's go back to uh, traverse here. 
So when we are in traverse, the first thing it checks is whether pointer is no or not. If pointer is no, it is skipping over this entire conditional statement and nothing will be done. If pointer is not no, it is going to go to, um, it's going to call traverse recursively. And the way it calls traverse you know, recursively is it is passing along the L member of the structure that PTR is pointing to as the first argument. And it's just going to pass array as is, you know, as the second um, parameter. And, you know, the, uh, the skipping the statement in between, which is the one that is kind of confusing. Um, and then the last thing it wants to do is to call traverse again. Basically the same thing as in on line 14, but this time we are using the R member of the structure that is pointed to by PTR instead of the L member that we used earlier. Um, so uh, that's basically what, tra what Traverse is going to do. Line 15 is the most confusing line. Um, so one way to deal with line 15 is to look at it as two distinct statements. So I'm going to do it here just that it's so that we can you know, kind of reference this in a more easy way. So you can basically ignore the plus plus and then do the plus plus on the next line. <clears throat> That's basically what a post increment uh, would do is you know, the actual increment is on the line that is following the original line. So that means you know, I don't need all of these parentheses anymore. Okay, if we can get rid of all those parentheses. And now it becomes a little bit more clean and easy to understand. So on the right hand side, we have the member value of the structure the PTR is pointing to. So how to access a member uh, a of a structure that a parameter pointer is pointing to, we have talked about that in class already in the previous class. So what is left to do is on the left hand side, we have a double D reference in this case. So what that means is we are overwriting the location that is pointed to by um, another pointer that in return is pointed to by um, the parameter array. So we have already talked about how to deal with one single dereference. So this is a double dereference, which means mm, we just need one more dereference. Um, so uh, that is something that I think you guys can figure out. Um, given you know, the sample programs that we have already talked about. Let me turn off my notification here because it is a little distracting. There we go. All right. So we are going, to, we are going ahead to test this program. And this is in the temp folder. Let me go to the temp folder here. GCC-G-O traverse, traverse.c. It all compiles and a GDB traverse. Okay, there we go. So this program is is a little bit complicated, um, the way it's, it's it's constructed. So one thing we can do is to put a breakpoint directly on line thirty eight, and we just run through this code and find out what is going to happen to array. So we run through this code, and by the time we get to line thirty eight. I'm going to say, okay, let's take a look at what is in the local variable array of main. And it has these content in it. So it doesn't look very, you know, uh, legible. But basically, we have three, four, five. Backslash T is a, uh, is a tab character. I cannot remember exactly what number it's corresponding to. So let's find out. Because we can also print each uh, member of array individually. And then it's going to show the actual value. So we have 1, 2, 5, and then we have the 9, and then finally we have the 10. So uh, if you are to look at 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, and then you look at the actual um, definition of the structures, you can see that 3, 4, 5, 9, 10 are the values of the five structures that we have here. So this means you know, Traverse is following a particular pattern of getting into all the different struct nodes definitions that we have here using the L member and all use, also using the R member in order to get to the individual um, uh, struct nodes 
and then you know every time it gets to one at some point in time it will store whatever value which is the middle uh, member of the structures to a new location in the global in the local variable array of main by using array pointer so that's kind of what it is going uh, what it's doing so obviously this code you know, is very difficult to implement you know, all in one shot and that is definitely not recommended so let me go ahead and talk about you know, how to uh, you know, approach this particular programming assignment so what I'll do is I'm going to copy traverse.c to traverse 0.c because this is you know, level 0 of implementing traverse all right so when you get to traverse you basically want to change this code enough so that it is easy to implement you know and we want to get the control structure out of the, the way first so that means we are going to okay let me uh, delete this comment here because I'm you know just gonna look at this program you know, the way it is right now and I'll comment out the sections that we do not want to deal with okay that's it okay so this program should not do a single thing that is particularly useful um, except you know there's a conditional statement here um, but you should be able to write this code this you know, code is a lot easier than the other one the question is how do you debug this code how do you know whether it's skipped over or not so basically what the one way to do that is to put a no op instruction here i cannot do the no op in um, C because you know you can I cannot uh, easily mix and match uh, C code into assembly code. There's a way to do it, but I cannot remember how to do it. Um, so I'm gonna use you know, this as <laughs> the no op. Uh, an empty block is basically equivalent to a no op in uh, TT2, TTP ASM. So you want to run this code and trace it. And the way you debug this particular program is change the parameter um, p uh, pointer when you call traverse. So when you call traverse, I would do it, you know, I would add one more function call here. So the second time you're gonna call it with a no pointer. So that means you know, with this one, uh, we should, you know, should execute the no op instruction. And then with this one, we should not execute the no op instruction. So this is how we can test whether this program is working or not by, you know, just you know, checking uh, whether the no-op instruction executes or not by passing different parameters to uh, PTR. So array is not even used in this case, which is fine. Okay, don't mess around with array. Just you know, kind of use a pointer and see whether you can make the decision or not. So this is level zero. All right. So I'm going to copy level zero to level one. So this is level one of the implementation of this program. So after that, we are going to try to implement one traverse. Okay, so we are not even going to bother with line 16 and 17 because I would say those two lines are probably one of the most complicated ones. So we're going to leave it alone until much later. So we'll take out the no up here and then we'll try to implement just you know, traverse and only you know, to the left hand side. So let's find out you know, what, how that is supposed to work. Um, so we are going to, okay, so we don't need this one anymore, uh, you know, because you know, uh, after level zero, you should know that the control structure is working fine. So we don't need to test for that one anymore. So now we are gonna uh, keep you know, the ampersand M1, the, the address of M1. So the first invocation of Traverse is gonna get a pointer to um, node n1 and at that point you know point uh, the pointer is not null because it is the address of m1 which is not zero so we get to line 14 which is traverse so it will pick up the l member of the structure that ptr is pointing to ptr at this point is pointing to m1 so th that means you know, it will pick up n2 or the address of n2 and use that as the first argument when we recursively call traverse on line 14. So we get to traverse again, but this time when we get to traverse, pointer is going to be the address of n2, which is this thing here. 
So by that time, you know, pointer is not null because it is the address of M2. And then we get to line 14. On line 14, it will try to pass, it would use the L member of the structure, which is M2. Um, and that is a null. But it will call that function. In other words, we will have a third invocation of traverse where the first argument is going to be null. So on that third traverse, um, it will get to line 14, and then it will see that pointer is in fact null in that case, and it will skip over the entire then portion, and then return to the second invocation of traverse, which would, which would, there's nothing else to do for the second uh, invocation of traverse because there's nothing after this, in which case it will exit the conditional statement and it will return to the first invocation of traverse, which is also at basically the same point, which is right after line 14. And once again, there's nothing else to do. It will exit the branch, uh, the then branch of the conditional statement and then return again. So that which should be the behavior in uh, this level one of the Traverse program. In fact, I can show it to you right away. So let me save the file and then we'll try to... Um, oh, this is... Okay, all right, so I need to do this. Okay, gcc-g-o Traverse 1, Traverse 1 1.c. And then we do a gdb Traverse 1. And then we'll put a breakpoint. Um, we we'll put a breakpoint on traverse. Okay, so we can we can actually do this. So B traverse will automatically put a breakpoint at the entry point of the function traverse like that. And then we just run the code, and you can see you know the first invocation of traverse has n one as the first argument or first parameter because we're looking at it from the perspective of the function. So it's called a parameter in this case. And if you just do a continue, not a single step, but continue execution, the second uh, invocation of traverse would have n2 as the first parameter. And if you continue one more time, it would have zero or the null pointer as the uh, first parameter. But what is interesting at this point is you can also do a BT at this point, you know, a backtrace. So we know how we get to the last invocation of traverse. So we start with main, main calls traverse, traverse calls traverse, traverse calls traverse. Now, that may not be, it may not sound very helpful, but when you look at the parameters, it is starting to become helpful because main calls traverse, the first invocation of traverse has the address of n1 as the first parameter, and then the second invocation has n2 as the first parameter of n2, and then the last invocation, the third, has a null pointer as you know, the first parameter. Now this is very important because um, you can actually statically analyze the, the entire stack and figure out, you know, have I pushed everything correctly on the stack, and so on. Okay, Be so you know, my one thing you can potentially do, okay, let me do an exit here, and go back to the source code here. So one thing you can potentially do is to um, kind of have an else here to correspond to you know, what happens when PDR is in fact a null uh, value, and then you put a halt here. I cannot do that in the C code because you know, there's no way for me to actually halt the entire program in C code, but you can put a halt here. So that means you know, at the end of the third invocation of Traverse, your program is gonna halt. Um, but that gives you a chance to take a look at the entire stack um, at that point, and you can try to double check and make sure that the content of the entire stack is correct based on you know, what we know should happen you know, for every invocation of Traverse. So once you get your know, um, level one done, okay, so we will go ahead and copy level one to level two. So with level two, um, what we can do, there are a few ways to do it. You know, you can kind of do the other one, which is you know, getting uh, traverse, the other traverse done, okay, which is um, gonna be interesting, okay, because this is not gonna be a hard step, because if you can get line 14 done, Getting line 17 done is kind of a copy and paste 
and then just change the reference of you know member L of the structure to a member R of the structure. Because if um, level one is working, then this level two should also work. However, the complication has to do with, uh, so in this case, um, what, would, what should you see you know, when traverse is called? Because you have a second recursive call in this case. So what would be helpful in this case? Okay, so I'm going to use comment to illustrate what is happening here. So basically with N1, it has uh, L, um, that is N2. It also has a R that is N. Okay, let me see. <laughs> I cannot remember all of those. So it has an R that is N3. N2 in return. Okay, so let me see how I should do this. I should probably use um, indentation and the next line. There we go. So N2 in return has an L member that is a null and it has a R member that is N4. <clears throat> N3 on the other hand has a L member that is N5 and a R member that is a null. And then N4 in return, so I know this is gonna look a little complicated, so N4 has an L member that is a null. It also has an R member that is a null. Same thing go for N5. It has a L member that is a null. It also has an R member that is also a null. So um, the way this particular program Traverse 2 is supposed to do is it will first get to N1 because you know, that's what we specify in the first invocation. Then it will go to the L member of N1, which is N2. Then it will try to go to the L member of N2, which is a null. And that is um, basically a dead end because it will be, um, when the first parameter is a zero, traverse simply returns. There's nothing else that it's gonna do. So it will return to the second invocation and then it will, at that point, it will try to explore the R member of N2, so we get to N4. And then at that point, it will go to the L member of N4, which is a null, so it will do nothing. There's nothing to do, but it will go there. And then go back to the third invocation of Traverse, and then it will also make another fourth invocation where the parameter, the first parameter is null, which will also do nothing, and then we'll go back to the third um, you go back to the third invocation of traverse and then at that point we have we are done with line 17 so that in return will return to the second invocation of traverse the second invocation of traverse is also done at this point because at that point we would have traversed you know, the r member as well so then it will return to the first invocation of traverse and then the first invocation of the traverse will then perform line 17 and it will explore, it will, it will do a call based on the R member. It will go to N3, and then it will do a um, third invocation of Traverse to N5, and then it will do a fourth invocation to Traverse with a null pointer, which has nothing to do, and will Im immediately return to the third invocation of Traverse, and then it will do a, another uh, fourth invocation of traverse to the R member, which is also a no, and it will go back to the third invocation of traverse. And at that point, the third invocation of traverse has nothing to do because we have already traversed both the L and the R member. And then at that point, it will return to the second invocation of traverse with N3. And then at that point, you know, it will go to um, the R member of N3, which is a null, which has nothing to do, then it will go back to the second invocation of Traverse, and then at that point, line 17 of the second invocation of Traverse is done, and then it will go back to the first invocation of Traverse, but at that point, you know, the line 17 of the first invocation of Traverse is also done, and then it will simply, you know, go back to main, and we are done at that point. So, <clears throat> so this part is kind of important, um, because um, you can actually check all of that stuff here because you can check what you're pushing on the stack and if you're pushing the address of um, a node on the stack you can actually see that 
in uh, TTP in in the analysis tab of TTP ASM. So you can actually you know if you implement this code in assembly, you can actually know you know, what it is going to do. Now, if you're doing uh, level three, I would advise you not to use N1 initially. So I would make the program, you know, kind of debug this program gradually. So I would start with, okay, so let me, um, okay, let me split the screen because I need to see both the initialization of the nodes and also the code here. So instead of going for N3 directly, the first traverse I would do is, um, so we're going to take baby steps at this, you know, when we are trying to debug this program. So the first one is something that we have seen already. Okay, just give it a null, and nothing really should happen. You have one single invocation of traverse. It returns immediately because of the way uh, traverse checks whether the, po the pointer is null or not first. So you will start with this one, and if it does work, then we go for the next one. Okay, so the next one is going to be a particular node that has both the L and the R member being null. So you can use N4 or N5, it, you know, either one is going to work just fine. So I'm going to use N4 here. So with this one, you would end up with two invocations of Traverse. And it's going to look a little bit complicated because the first invocation would use N4, the address of N4 as the first uh, parameter. But the second invocation, there will be two cases of the second invocation. And they're both going to have uh, a null pointer as the first parameter. So this one is slightly more complicated than the first one, but it is still not complicated enough that you would have um, two invocations that also has a um, as a two invocations with the address of a specific node as the first parameter. So if this works, then you go for the next one. Okay, you go for um, n. Um, well, you can go for N3 or N2, you know, uh, so either one is going to work because either one has at least one of the R or the L member being non-null, so that means, you know, now we can check whether the, um, you're passing that correctly or not. To be, yeah, so you kind of need to do that, um, you know, check it with N2 and then check it with N3. So if both of these are working, then you should probably have the code written correctly already because if uh, N2 and N3 are both working out or the address of N2 and the address of N3 are both working out as the first um, parameter of Traverse, then you can go all the way back to uh, the address of N1 because at that point, um, I'm fairly sure that you know, the program should be working because if all of these are working, you have tested every single possible case of the recursive calls. And if all the recursive calls are done correctly, then the top level call is going to be, it's gonna work just fine. So that would be my advice for level two of this code. Okay, so we get rid of this, and then we'll talk about you know, level three of this code. So we go from traverse two to traverse three, and then we look at what traverse three should be doing. Okay, so there's not much else to do, right? So you would say, maybe we should just implement both of these lines. Well, that's not, okay? So we'll go ahead and only implement one line, which is just this line here. So that means it's going to override the first element of the uh, local variable array of main repetitively without incrementing um, uh, array pointer of main as a function. So what this one is going to do is it will still follow the same traversal order you know, that we talked about earlier, except that it would also you know, overwrite um, the first element of the array, globe, uh, array local variable of main. Um, and this is called an in-order traversal. Uh, we will overwrite that value only when we get back to itself. So that means, um, okay, let me add, okay, I need to also point out you know, the value of each node now. So N1 has a value of five, N2 has a value of three, N3 has a value of 10, N5 has a value of nine, N4 has a value of 
four. There we go. All right. So, <clears throat> so the writing of these values in parentheses is between the traverse call of the left member, the L member, and the traverse of the R member. So the order of you know the values being you know, over, being used to overwrite um, the first element of main is going to be. Um, so we have uh, M1, it goes to N2, N2 um, goes to the L member, there's nothing. So 3 is going to be written first before we go to the R member of N2. And then on the R member of N2, we go to the um, M4, sorry. So M4 is going to then go, into, go to the L member, it returns, and th then 4 is going to be written before it goes to the R member of N4. And then at that point, you know, we have a bunch of return because you know, the R member or M4 is all done at this point. Then we'll go back to N2. And also at that point, N2 is all done, so we get back to N1. And when we get back to M1 after exploring or traversing its L member, then 5 is going to be written. So we have 3, 4, 5 written. And then it will go to the R member, which is here. The R member, or N3 in this case, will go to its L member which is M5, and then it will go to the L member of N5, which is a null. Then we go back to N5, then we'll write the 9, and then we'll go to the R member, and then at which point here we are done with N5. Then we'll go back to N3. Since we are coming back to N3, after the L member is traversed, um, then we'll write the final value, which is 10, to the first element of the local variable array of main. And then it will go to the R member, which is also a no, there's nothing to do here. Then we'll come back here and N3 is done. When N3 is all done, we go back to M1. But at that point, M1 also has both of its L and the R members done. So at that point, the program goes back to main and we're all done here. All right, so once again, um, you can follow the same order here. You know, give it a null pointer, at which, in which case nothing should be overriding um, the first element of array. And then if this one should overwrite just one element. This one should overwrite two elements. This one should overwrite, um, let me think, <laughs> and two and three, oh, only two elements. And then when you use this one, it should overwrite all five elements. The best thing about this is we can actually debug this program in uh, C using GDB. Let me illustrate how to do this in, um, in C. Um, so we use a gcc-g-o traverse 3, traverse 3 dot C, let's go like that. Oh, okay, this is supposed to be traverse 3 dot C, there we go. So, and then we GDB traverse 3, do a list here. And uh, this time we want to put the breakpoint in traverse. So let's take a look at, at what is in traverse. And we want to put a breakpoint on line 15 here. Because every time we get to line 15, we want to know exactly what value is being used to overwrite um, the uh, new un unsigned AB integer that is pointed to by a pointer that in return is pointed to by array. Um, so we'll put a breakpoint here and we just run the code. Okay, so this is the first time it gets overwritten and we can see that you know, um, a pointer is pointing to N2. So when we ask you know, what is the value of the structure, um, what is the value of the member value of the structure that pointer is pointing to, it is the three. So we know three is going to overwrite whatever is pointed to by a pointer that in return is pointed to by array. So we want to investi investigate that one too. We, we want to know what location are we actually overwriting. So uh, we already know what array is. So we want to print whatever is array is pointing to. It's pointing to something that looks like this. So at this point, you have to remember how we passed uh, the second um, argument when we called traverse. It is supposed to be the address of array pointer of um, as a local variable of main. So now we do a BT backtrace, and you can see that we are already in the second um, uh, invocation of traverse. So that means in order to go back to main, now we have to go to frame two. 
then at this point we can say okay tell me what is the address of array pointer and we can see that the address of array pointer is in fact you know, this thing here so the next question is but what about the value that we just looked at what about this thing here this is what is pointed to um, this is the okay this is the value of local variable array pointer of main which was initialized to point to the first element of the local variable array of main so now we can ask okay is that really the case show me the address of the first member or first element of the array local variable of main this is of main and now we can see that ah okay so that's what it is so that means you know when we execute line 15 the left hand side is actually just referencing um, the first element of the array local variable of main okay so um, you don't have to do a frame you know, but I'm gonna do it so let's do a frame uh, zero to go back to exactly where we were we do a single step okay now we go back to main which is a uh, frame two and then we ask um, what is the value of the first member or the first element of the, the local variable array of main and it is three okay so this is the verification of the program is kind of working the way I just described it and obviously this is the most complicated case uh, because we're using n1 uh, when we called traverse from main um, but everything is still consistent with what I talked about before so it's really kind of important to kind of understand how the program is supposed to work because you know when you look at the trace from the assembler um, the nice thing about the trace from the assembler is it shows you the entire full history of what is going on as your program executes there's no need to put a breakpoint anywhere because it tracks everything it tracks all the memory read it tracks all the memory write it tracks all the changes to the uh, registers it also change you know, tracks all the changes to the flags register which in this particular case is not particularly helpful except for when you try to um, implement the control structure so um, that is done here okay so now we go to stage four okay so now we copy uh, traverse three to traverse four and then we look at traverse four and we go like what is left to do well this is the only thing that is left to do okay um, so what this does is it increments whatever array points to so in this case this array is a double pointer um, it is the address of array pointer of main so that means you know when once one the reference you know the parenthesized portion of this expression is referencing array pointer of main and we are basically incrementing that so that means you know um, with this implemented then the program should actually do whatever the entire program is supposed to do so in other words stage four is the ultimate goal okay this is you know, what you want to turn in you know when you fully implement this entire program um, is that it will fill up the entire array local variable of main over here um, uh, with the values you know three four five nine and ten in that particular order um, and that has to do with how um, the structures how the nodes are pointing to each other um, and this is a textual way to look at it I know it doesn't you know, look it doesn't it's not as intuitive as a graphical way you know drawing a a tree but you know nonetheless you know this is basically the structure of how things are organized in this particular case all right so I am going to um, exit from here okay you know in, well okay let me do one more thing okay because I just want to make sure this is working okay so I have a GCC dash G dash O traverse 4 traverse 4 dot C and then GDB traverse 4 traverse 
<coughs> um, and I'm just going to look at main and put a breakpoint at the very end, which is line 57. Just as, as a quick check to make sure this is working the way it's supposed to. Run the code, and then we print array bracket 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this is indeed uh, working the way it's supposed to. All right. So what I'll do is I'm going to give you all of this. Okay. So I will give you uh, the original traverse.c and then each stage. So there's stage 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus you know, the traverse.ttp ASM. So all of the um, files that are referenced in this particular video recording is going to be in the zip file and I will send it to you by announcement. So let me just do that first, in case traverse, um, I'll call this traverse stages, okay? So that way you understand that there's there's trace, there's level zero, level one, level two, level three, level four, and finally level four, and also you know, the uh, traverse.ttp ASM, um, there we go. So there you go. And I can now put this in to the announcement. Okay, so you can you should probably see this part too. You know, just a portion of the browser window, which is fine. So I'm going to put a announcement here and say stages of traverse of the traverse program attached and include that and that is traverse dot zip there we go. traverse stages dot zip there we go all right and then publish all right cool all right, so this means, you know, at this point in time, you have, okay, obviously I'm gonna upload the video as well, okay? Um, so that means at this point, you have uh, some, I would say rather, you know, step-by-step, -step, your method to approach the Traverse program. Um, it really helps if you have um, some experience with, uh, revision control so that way you you can kind of keep track of you know the code that works and then move on you know and do something and if that something doesn't work out you have a place to fall back on um, the most primitive way to do that is simply to save the file you know based on um, the date and the time so that way you know you can have you basically end up with a long list of versions of the same program but because of the date and time you also know you know which one is earlier which one is later i'll give you an example so that means you know um, in windows you can just do it in the gui but i'm using linux so i'm going to do it in a, a command line so that means you know, if i have a ttp asm that is partially working it's kind of good because you know i got what i intend to do working then i would copy that to a file with the date and the time. Um, since you know, we are not going to cross the year boundary, it's always you know, fine to be just like 05, and today is 04. So 04, 05, 05, 04, sorry. Um, followed by the time, and the time right now is um, 0824, you know, 824 in the morning. Um, so that way, you know, uh, once I do this, then I have a particular file capturing my progress up to this point okay so that's going to be handy um, I will have another you know recommendation you know this is also you know, kind of up to you whether you want to do it this way or not but I use this approach a lot oh um, because the file is already open in the other window uh, I believe this is the one okay so um, the, the way I do things is um, a lot of times you know when I know what I should do next I would give myself a little to-do um, comment and say, you know, uh, try to implement blah, blah, blah next. So this is a reminder to myself. It's like, okay, now that I got, you know, once I get 
what I'm working on, currently working on done, you know, what is the next thing that I need to do? So, you know, I can leave behind these little reminders so that I don't forget, you know, what I'm supposed to work on next. Um, but that's, you know, that's up to you. I mean, you know, your, the style that you want to approach this program is entirely up to you. Um, you do not need to submit, uh, you know, stage zero to four to me. You can just submit, you know, whatever last version is working to me. Um, as far as grading is concerned, um, I want to be a little bit flexible this time, which means, you know, if people can get, you know, stage, a particular stage done, I want to give partial credit for getting, you know, anything before stage four done. And, you know, so, so that people have, can get partial credit, you know, just by, you know, kind of approaching this particular, uh, you know, programming assignment in a staged way so that it's not all or none. Okay, if you cannot get to stage four, you get a zero. That would not be, um, yeah, that would not be nice, okay? But, you know, so that's why I want it to be uh, based on which stage you're at. And I will need a way to know which stage you're at, you know, because when you submit the file, it's just a file to me. And, you know, I need some way that you can tell me, you know, which stage you have completed and I can test the program only for that particular stage. So I'll work on that later, okay? Um, what you need to do is to um, kind of determine how you want to approach this. Now, if you're confident with your programming skills and your understanding of the material, you can start with stage three, for instance, okay? You don't have to start with stage zero. Um, but personally, I would start with stage zero myself, okay? Because, you know, I don't like to write a whole lot of code without testing the code and finding out that, okay, it's at least working up to this point, check it in, okay? You know, just, you know, save the file with the, with the uh, date and time, and then move on to the next thing that I need to work on. Because this way, I don't have to worry about if the program doesn't work, which one of these 50 lines is the problem. I don't have to worry about that because every time I'm only introducing maybe five to 10 lines to the program. So it makes it easier for me to f figure out, oh, okay, whatever is wrong has to be these five to 10 lines. And that, that's a whole lot easier to look at, you know, 40, 50 lines of code and try to figure out which one is not right. All right, so one last thing, okay? Reefer Spider is going to be very useful here. So if you cannot get Reefer Spider to install or to work, be sure to come to my office hour. Uh, I have office hours on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, I mean, Wednesday and Thursday. So hopefully you will get to me, you ask, ask for help you know, before it's too late, okay? But everything starts with understanding the C code, okay? And that does not need a Reefer Spider. So I would, uh, I think that's the end of this particular lecture. And uh, yes, you know, if you are wondering what is that background music, you know, I do have some background music playing right now. Um, hopefully uh, YouTube is not gonna call out, you know, for uh, copyright infringement because of the audio. Uh, sometimes it does that, you know, it would actually recognize the music. But since I'm talking the entire time, you know, maybe it won't pick up the music and go like, hey, this is copyrighted music, you cannot just put it onto your YouTube. We'll see, we'll see. All right, I will stop the recording now and push it online.